people, everyone. Yes, thank you all for coming. Uh, we're ready to begin. My name is Spencer Martin. Uh, I'm the Collections Coordinator for the HRC, uh, and I'm happy you're all joining us today. Um, so we're here today uh, for a special workshop from the Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation uh, titled Tactics of Resistance. Uh, so, so thank you all for coming, and uh, Jonathan, it's, uh, it's all yours. Okay, thanks so much, Spencer. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for... Thanks for showing up today and I uh, hope folks are doing well. If everybody could, as a few more people I'm sure are gonna be coming in, if you could go ahead and answer a few questions in the chat, I just put it in there. If you could uh, type in your name, where and what you teach and what you're excited for in today's workshop. Um, and then we're gonna be uh, the starting the starting the workshop um, be great to, if we can see people's faces at the beginning and uh, a couple other participatory places. I know everybody's probably, you know, coming in after after a busy day at, at school. So if you need to stay off video, that's fine. But it's nice to be able to see everybody's faces. And we'll get started with the workshop itself in just a moment. Great. But meanwhile, it's great if everybody can introduce yourselves, know what people here are teaching. Um, if y'all, um, you could also just unmute yourself and uh, and just introduce yourself in the video. Okay. Welcome, Alina. If I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Oh, great. Got lots of people here. All right, math. Excellent, grade school, US history. Hello, Sarah, and hello, Laura. Hi, Sue. Welcome, Henry. Hi, Anna. Evilio, Evilio. If I'm pronouncing that correctly. If I'm mispronouncing your name, please correct me. Um, in broadcasting, oh, interesting. We have a lot of films. Um, Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation, we've made, I think we're up to 13 films, 11, somewhere in there, um, all on our website. I'll show you how to get to those during this. Lots of big multimedia. Um, welcome, Doug. And... Rebecca, Anne, Michelle, great. How to reduce hate in this country? Well, all right, that's what we're we're, we're hoping we'll be able to uh, to accomplish. I'm I'm sure we're all hoping to accomplish that. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, Elise. Great. Excellent. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started here. So let me go ahead and uh, share screen for a moment here. And there we go. All right, and can everybody see, see this on the screen? Great. So, Welcome to Tactics of Resistance, Responding to Hate. Uh, my name is Jonathan First. I'm the Director of Education for the Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation. We make films, curricula, do workshops, and have online teacher training about Jews who fought back during the Nazis. And we're going to be talking about Tactics of Resistance, which is a framework for analyzing conflict and brainstorming solutions. So this is a lesson. It's um, a two-class lesson, and we use the Jewish partisans as a lens for looking at aggression and resistance and how people respond to that, the long and short-term effects of that. And then you can use that once you've gone through and use that to analyze the scenarios that we have and go in-depth discussions about what is an appropriate response to different kinds of aggression. Because as we know, 
we have situations where you know we have kids shooting each other over sneakers you know the the climate and the political climate in this country is so strange and what kind of what we want to do is talk about what is an appropriate level is um and how to actually think about aggression and 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 resistance in in um terms of how intense is that aggression how intense is that resistance what is appropriate because we believe you know at, at the jewish partisans um that sometimes violence is an appropriate answer and resist in response to times of genocide but we don't want kids to be looking at the partisans or studying history and saying okay well these people use violence now it's appropriate to use it here so that's part of what we're trying what we're trying to do um but then you can take this this framework that we have and apply it to other situations to history to current events and also to situations in your students own lives in terms of creating scenarios and looking at possible responses and then analyzing what it what might be a good response in this situation so Right now, we're right here in this in this welcome part. We're gonna take, um, then we're gonna go ahead and talk about aggression resistance, uh, talk about Jewish resistance and the Jewish partisans. We'll get into tactics and then have a short break, finish that up, and I'll, then I'll go through all the resources and have a, have a conclusion. We'll be finished by six o'clock Pacific time. Uh, any questions before we get started? Um, or if anyone has an accessibility need, uh, you need me to talk slower or louder, whatever, please, um, please feel free to let me know. Great. So, number one question that people get during the, teaching the Holocaust, right? This is a question you might, your own students might have um, sent. Has anybody ever had this question asked, why didn't the Jews fight back? Yep. And uh, Anna, how do you answer them? Uh, so it's happened in different circumstances. And I've talked about the fact that they did. <laughs> like there, there are many ways in which there was resistance. It's just that that might not necessarily be what's taught or what they've heard or what they've seen in movies. And of course, I'm not talking about Inglorious Bastards or movies that are fictitious, right? So yeah, I try and focus on the things that did actually happen and the ways in which there was resistance. Great, great. So we're gonna give you some resources here to uh, help you expand with that um, and some rare archival uh, images that people may not, may not have seen. Has anybody else ever heard anyone, whether it's a student or not, ask this question, why didn't the Jews fight back? Uh, I've had a similar asking um, I teach night from Elie Wiesel. That's sort of the realm I look at it from in literature. And so outside of going through the text and only looking at uh, Ellie's experience, like, like he doesn't really focus on that aspect in night. So it, I need ancillary resources to go into that, but I bet you you're going to help me with some ancillary resources. So okay. thank you for that. Hoping, hoping I'll be able to do that. <laughs> Um, no, we've been doing this for quite some time. So uh, people, um, you know, we've reached hundreds of thousands of students throughout the world. And thousands of educators use the, use our material. So hopefully, this will be uh, useful material for you as well. Thank you very much. So, yeah. So let me come back here. All right. So we're back to the presentation. Everybody can see that. Yeah. So. Question, why didn't the Jews fight back? The answer is that they did. And we call this the myth of sheep to the slaughter. So. I'm sorry, am I the only one who can't see the slide? There's like a pattern over it. No, you're not the only one. I'm seeing okay. the same thing. All right. So Spencer's gonna go ahead and show the slide. Hopefully this will work. We had a suspicion yeah, that this sure. could happen. So we had a backup plan. <laughs> So I'll stop sharing. Sure, just give me one sec. Um, in the meantime, while, oh, there we go. Okay. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Okay, thank you, Spencer. Can folks see that? Oh, great. 
right here, right? Yeah. So the okay. next slide. The next slide. Okay. Yeah. Great. So yeah, so we call this the myth of the sheep to the slaughter. And the idea that Jews didn't fight back, that is a, a stereotype that has many origins, but it suits the Nazis' uh, purposes perfectly. And the Nazis put out this idea, right? That not only, first off, you know, that, that there was no uh, murder campaign happening, but they also put this idea that Jews are weak and defenseless, and that you know they're easy to take advantage of in a lesser race and this idea has been perpetuated post holocaust that jews didn't fight back either armed or unarmed and if we you know allowing this to to go on actually in media and popular culture it's doing the nazis work for them and giving them a win beyond the grave as is showing certain images um, from the Holocaust, you see, you know, the famous image of the kid, right, with his hands, hands up in the air. And we need to show a certain amount of images to show what really happened. But if we only show that side of the Holocaust, there's a whole another side that we're missing. It also sends, I believe, the the idea that during times of oppression, especially genocide, that people don't resist at all because we only see the victims. We hardly ever see the resistance. And part of what I want to I feel my mission in life is, and part of what JPEF wants to put across, is that people always resist to the best of their abilities. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So uh, I work for the Jewish Partisan Educational Foundation. As I said, we create films and curricula and online teacher training and in-person workshops in person on video uh, as well, uh, about Jews who fought back against the Nazis. Um, we have an extensive website with all sorts of resources you can use. We'll get, get to that. Can you go to the next slide, please? And uh, yeah, this is our e-learning course. Um, you can earn free CEUs through our e-learning course accredited uh, through Tarot College. So. Um, you're not only getting credit for this, you're getting credit for that. Also, in the state of New Jersey, our e-learning um, courses are also, as far as I know, still, um, you know, we set it up years ago with the Holocaust Commission for you to be able to get credits. Um, and I believe that's still the case. So you can still get that. And I'll, um, I know that uh, Adara has been looking into that and we'll, we'll be able to follow up with you uh, about that. Jonathan, just to let Jonathan, just to let you know, if that's not the case, I'm the executive director of the Holocaust Commission, so I'll make sure that that happens. Excellent. Thank you, Todd. Wonderful. Wonderful. Next slide, please. Much appreciated. So this is just a, a brief list of some of what we do. We interviewed many, many Jewish partisans in order to make our films, made all these other resources. Um, we actually have a new website where uh, we're crowdsourcing other partisan stories, and I'll go ahead and show that to you. So there's probably by now over 100 Jewish partisan uh, profiles on, online. Next slide. And yeah, just a list of some of what we, of what we have. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to get into the Tactics of Resistance lesson plan. Um, we'll go ahead and you can download this for free off our website. And I'll show you, once again, easy, easy to do. Next slide. So, as I said, kind of at the heart of this, we're talking about aggression and resistance. So I'd love for people to um, volunteer what, how would you define aggression? This is one of the things, parts of the lesson. We're gonna we're gonna kind of do pieces of the lesson. We're gonna have have talks. So we'll have an experience, a chance to do some of each. And right now we're just gonna kind of jump in to a little bit of the lesson. So one of the things we ask the students is like, let's define our terms and let them help build the terms. So how would you folks define aggression? Uh, I would say it's one person um, trying to have power over another. One person trying to have power over. Okay, great. Can we have like one one or two more definitions? I was Someone trying to 
something like that, like an exercise of power. Okay, exercise of power. Great. Someone trying to force someone to do something that they don't necessarily want to do. Forcing someone to do something they don't want to do. Okay, so against their will. Yeah. When someone has um, either a hostile or violent tendency toward another person or another group or view. Gotcha. Great. Great. These are all great definitions. I'm going to show you a working definition that we have, and we can modify that definition. If we can go to the next slide. So if we define aggression as any act intended to cause harm to or dominate someone else, does that does that fit in with what people were saying? Would we want to modify this in any way, or is that does that work pretty well? Great. So we'll go on to the next slide and talk about aggression. So the response to aggression resistance. How would you define resistance? Uh, can I go back to the last piece on dominate? I think that's that's a word that could use a little bit more definition. Wait, what, can you just run, run me through what do you mean by dominate? Oh, okay, interesting. Um, to I think I think people pretty much hit it in this uh, you know power forcing someone to do something against their will. Okay. Um, no, but I, it could I, also I have be sixth, eighth graders, so. I'm gonna say like that's that's a content area vocabulary word for 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 my folks. Like what dominate is not gonna be native vocabulary to my my kids. But okay. That's I, great. I, I, yeah. I Thank that's you. That's a great, a great point. I think part of the reason why we we put the word dominate in there is it also kind of um, gives you an idea of it also I, I think kind of a, gets into like systemic oppression, mm -hmm. right? To creating an atmosphere. Um that, that is oppressive. Thank uh, you. So both both structurally and just kind of you know the general um, the, the general zeitgeist. Okay, so resistance. How would you, how would you define resistance? By the way, to reappropriate German term. Anyways, um, I would I would say um, asserting yourself, which. Um, respects yourself as well as the other side, but then in terms of hostility, that might not be so great. <laughs> Asserting for self-respect, great. Opposition. Opposition. I would like to add kind of um, maintaining one's position. Mm. Great, maintaining one's position, right. And despite people's efforts to change that. Exactly. Great, great. And um, when they have a resistance, isn't it a, a lesser amount of people who are going maybe against the popular idea? Um, and so, so the reason they're resisting is because they have their true belief of how they feel. Great, great. So um, this is good because you, you have kind of different cases of resistance where it's a small number being dominated or there's an attempt to dominate by a larger number. And then in other times, right, it's a small number of armed people who are attempting to force a large number of people. Like that's what war is about. Um, so it's a, it, it, could go, it could go both ways, but that's a very interesting point. You can have great discussion about that. Um, so, Let's go to the next slide, and here's our working definition. Would someone care to just read that out? Uh, any act of organized or personal opposition to aggression. So does that, uh, does that work for us for today? Great. Great. And, um, you know, uh, as I said, you, for folks who came in late, if you can uh, turn on your camera so we can get this community feeling, that is wonderful. If you need to stay off camera, that's fine. Just a little hint, if you want to see more people, you can always grab the little hairline between the shared screen and where people are, drag it over the left, and you can see more people. That's what I'm doing to see all you. Um, Great. So one thing that we would go do in the next le in in the lesson then is say why is it important to resist? Why do people resist? And someone already said self respect. Can you think of like one or two other reasons why resistance is important? 
Maybe just could also be the general greater good. The general greater good. And Anna, you were about to say? Yeah, I was going to say it could literally be for your survival or safety. Right. Survival, safety, security. Right. So there are a bunch of reasons. Everything from, you know, kind of large for doing it for other people, for future generations, to doing it just because I need to feel good about myself. Um, okay, next slide. Great. So that's 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 where that's what we're up to. Is anybody else um, want to add one one thing? Well, I think you want to share your opposition to what the other side's doing, and then you have different levels of resistance based on your capabilities. Like Americans, my students will say, "I'm going to get my guns. I'm going to fight them." I go, "Okay, what are you going to do if you don't have any guns?" Um, so you can. People during the Holocaust put their resistance and taking histories and hoping somebody would find their stuff afterwards, their spiritual resistance. There's different levels of resistance that you can have in order to show your opposition. It may not turn out well in the end, but at least the other side realized that you were going down swinging on some level. Great, great, thank you. You know, one of the things that I like to say is that just because you don't win doesn't mean it wasn't worth it. Right. Right? Resistance is always fertile. The other thing is if you don't resist, you're condoning the action. Mm. Yeah, you become complicit in some ways, yeah. Um, great, so one of the things that we're gonna do is one of the, the things that we're gonna do is later on, we're gonna walk through the events of January 6th and look at it from the point of view of the insurrectionists and also the response to the insurrectionists because, you know, one person's partisan, one person's resistance fighter is another person's terrorist. And um, it's, you know, what we like to complicate, we like, we like to complicate students thinking. We don't want to give them, this is the correct answer. We really want them to be able to, um, to, to look at, at the nuance because none of these subjects are, are ever, um, you know, are ever really clear cut. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. We're um, in this lesson, we go ahead and talk about different kinds of resistance, different categories of resistance, going through um, sort of less intense to more intense. So starting off with non-confrontational resistance. So this is non-violence that doesn't directly uh, involve the aggressor. So for example, putting out a leaflet, right? They're not, you're, not, you're not directly engaging with them. Um, next, confrontational resistance. You could also call this direct action, right? Directly, di direct defiance. And then after that, we get to armed or violent resistance. Um, and, you know, we, we've tweaked this to say, you know, to, to talk about um, attacking their allies or assets. So, you know, property violence in activist circles is always a question, like, what is that? Is that nonviolent? Is that not nonviolent? Different degrees. Just for this, we're gonna, we're, we're putting that within the, the category of, of violence. Next slide. Okay, so how did Jews resist the Holocaust? I'm gonna give you a brief overview of some methods that Jews use to, res to resist the Holocaust. And what we would do with students is that we will ask them, okay, is this confrontational, non-confrontational, or violent resistance? Just kind of get our terms down. So these are archival photos that you may not have seen before. Uh, this is, and we're gonna kind of um, speed th through them. I'm gonna point out a couple, but this is the Jewish resistance slideshow. You can use this with or without the lesson. It's available on our website. So um, if, if there's one or two that people have questions about or want to ask, you go ahead and go ahead and pause me. So um, yeah, this is from a Yiddish newspaper um, in the Warsaw ghetto. And once again, for, for if people can't see it, the, the, the caption there, fascism must be smashed. This is uh, one of my favorite illustrations. Next. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, go back for a moment. So, violent, confrontational, or non-confrontational? Non-confrontational. 
non-confrontational, right? Okay, great, next. So escape, the first kinder transport, right? Helping, helping smuggle people. Once again, this would be non-confrontational. Let's go on to the next one. Speaking up, so this is Abba Kovner, who is the leader of the, um, the Vilda resistance. And he wrote this manifesto where he says, we will not be led like sheep to the slaughter. Arise, arise with your last breath. How would you define this one? Confrontational, non-confrontational, violent? I'm not sure because he's, he's calling for an action, mm -hmm. although he's not taking the action. I mean, he may be taking the action, but he's standing up in front. He's not just sending a leaflet or a flyer. So I feel like it's confrontational without being physical, but he's calling people to, to resist. Yeah. So it kind of depends on the context. And another question is, is insurrection to riot, you know, is, is calling for violence, is that in itself a violent act? I would say probably it's a, it's a step below, but, um, you know, are you responsible for that violence? That's a big question right now. But is it only just the physical violence too? Like there's other ways of being violent. Um, stopping people from getting funds for certain things and you know all those i feel like it's not just physical there's so many other you yes. know violent acts that you can commit right keep that in mind we're going to get to that okay. that's great that's great um let's kind of just go through this slideshow a little bit more so ghetto revolts and camp uprising this is a painting that came to light um fairly recently uh, about 10 years ago and this is very different from most images of the Holocaust. What's something about this image that's different than the other images you might have seen about the Holocaust? It shows people having agency. It definitely, the, the foreground of the painting or the where the eye is attracted in the middle of the painting is definitely the guy throwing what seems to be a potato masher grenade, right? Mm -hmm. He, he is the focus of this painting. And while you do have the people hiding out underneath the uh, sort of stack of rubble, and you do have the Nazis that they're attacking, this is very much a active voice look at resistance. Right, right. So um, yeah, there's, uh, we once had a course where there was uh, someone who, who teaches art history and the whole, the, we, we went into this for about 15 minutes. There's a lot that you could dissect from here. Something else that's very different about this, this uh, image is it's in color. And most of our impression of the Holocaust is in black and white and there's this kind of remove, right? Um, next slide. And we'll just kind of go through, oh yeah, obviously violence. This is another favorite August Landmesser refusing to salute Hitler. He's hit in this photo, it was said that Hitler was off screen. Obviously, we'd go through and talk about some of these. And as you said, some of these are, are gray areas, what, what it would be, what it would be considered. But I just want to kind of show you some of these photos. So if you can just kind of slide through and we'll keep going. Documentation, Sam Frank here. This is a really one of the favorites. It's, if you can, can tell in the background, there's a Nazi flag on the government building and in the foreground, it's the eighth night of Hanukkah. And I actually got to talk to the family, uh, uh, the, the family who, who did this. They lit that candle in the window every night for eight nights, even though the, the government building had been taken over by the Nazis. Next. And of course, partisan warfare. This is Frank Leichmann, youngest platoon commander in his all Jewish partisan unit. We'll be talking about him a little bit more. So the question, Right, can someone go ahead and read that for us, please? The question is not why all the Jews did not fight, but how so many of them did. Tormented, beaten, starved, where did they find the strength, spiritual and physical, to resist? So words of it, Elie Wiesel. So, um, yeah, so can we kind of have a, an overview of that and um, one of the things that we're trying to, to show in the, at JPEF is that, you know, the, the Jewish partisan armed resistance was the tip of the iceberg, that really millions of people were resisting 
always in mass situations of genocide. Most uh, most everybody who can and who is aware of what's going on does does resist. But it's not just the story of six million Jews who were murdered and millions of more who were tortured and enslaved and raped and and mutilated. And these terms are not polite terms, but there's nothing polite about the Holocaust. So we really don't want to mince words um, when we talk about the Holocaust. Obviously, you want to be age appropriate. But um, but as much of that horror as, as there is, it's also the story of millions of those same millions of Jews, non-Jews, other people who stood up and resisted to the very best of their ability, even if it was just sharing a crust of bread with someone when they knew that they would be missing that and they could get shot for that. Just keeping your dignity for one more day. And also millions of people around the world rose up and that is why the thousand year right only lasted a few years. And the people who were being oppressed are still here, to, you know, their generations are still here today. Anything before we go on? Okay, great. We're gonna go on to the Jewish partisans. So, um, Spencer, if you can go ahead and show this film, that would be great. This is the, introdu to the introduction to the Jewish partisans film. It's on JPEF's website. Great, and it's also on YouTube. I put it on. Can everyone hear this? No. No, no sound. Spencer, are you able to hear it? Yes, I can hear it. I, okay. I, uh, let me just see. Are you sharing? Yeah, are you sharing with the optimized for audio? Uh. I mean, I'll stop sharing for one second and I'll share again. I need to go back and click. Great. Experience during the Holocaust. You're good. Thank you. I think it, it paused it. Yeah, oh, we're starting again, great. These are the images that come to mind when people think about the Jewish experience during the Holocaust. But these are not the only images. There were 20 to 30,000 Jews who formed organized armed resistance groups all throughout Europe. These little known freedom fighters conducted thousands of acts of sabotage against their Nazi oppressors. They were known as Jewish partisans. People did not go only like sheep to their death. People were fighting every which way they can. I did my job the best I could. I was in many battles with the Germans face to face. Sometimes maybe a hundred foot away. And uh, bullets were flying all the sides. And luckily, I survived. Let's say a German column was marching to, uh, through us. They ambushed them. The partisans, they fought for freedom, for a better tomorrow, for a better future. And they fought 
fought in order not to be eliminated by the Germans, against the Germans. Jewish partisans were responsible for the liberation of thousands of Jews trapped in ghettos, saving them from annihilation. I started to organize an escape. I had 55 people that they were willing to escape. From the 55, 30 were killed. 25 made it into the woods. Without the forest, we couldn't survive. The trees, the sky, the pine needle ground were our summer home. The underground hut was our winter home. We're dealing with friendly and unfriendly peasants. The friendly peasants supported us with food and with ammunition. The unfriendly peasants had no choice. We would get in at night, pick up the prepared food orders that were prepared for the Germans and leave receipts. The partisans were here. The moon was our biggest enemy because if there was a moon night, because in day we couldn't go, in the night. If there was a moonlight night, we could move. So the night, the blizzard, heavy snow, heavy rain, this was our, this was our friends. Jewish partisans committed thousands of acts of sabotage, significantly impeding the Nazi war effort. We were interested in getting involved in sabotage acts to interrupt and disrupt the communication and transportation to the front. We attacked the depot. We hit the guard and got ammunition, and we blew up the train depot. We could see the Germans there, and I could recognize the Germans that I wanted to kill, who killed my friend. And, and they started to shoot, to, uh, shoot towards us, but when they shot, they shot all only with, from revolvers. They were not prepared, they didn't have rifles, they didn't have machine guns. We overpowered them, so little by little their shooting stopped. We had to blow up a train, and um, it was sitting in the background and waiting till the train approached, and some of the Germans got killed. It's the same to Jews as it is to Americans to, to study the Revolutionary War and its heroes, right? People put their chest in front of, of English muskets to build a country. We put our chest in front of German muskets to, to defend ourselves from annihilation and maybe prevent the death of other Jews. If I was going to get killed, I was going to get killed as a fighter. Not because I'm a Jew. I survived for two legacies, for revenge and for telling the story. Revenge from my father in telling the story from my mother. So if I had the chance, and if I looked for, a re for, for resistance, this was the most important thing for me. And I didn't care if I would be killed, if I wouldn't be killed, I had to do it. There's such a thing as fighting back. This is the way I think. That's why I'm sitting here to give you, give you the interview. Why else would I do it? I want the people to know that we were fighting. This is the hymn of Jewish partisans. So many came last to gaze them last in vain. Came the night of festival and bright day. Come and wait the sun so always gebenk the show. Sweat a point in the dark me rain and do. Come and wait the sun so always gebenk the show. Sweat a point in the dark me rain and do. Sprotzen wet dort unser Gwore unser Mut. Gesingen mit Naganes in die Hände. Du sagst da voll Thank you, Spencer. Could you stop uh, sharing screen? Great. So, um, how many people, uh, or let me just ask you this. How do you think your students would respond after they've seen that film? How would they react? I would think they would have a much more positive view since they didn't know before they came into the class. Because like you said, the stereotypical answer is they didn't fight back. 
Mm -hmm. Just a side question, the uniforms that they had on, because I know there's questions if I use this, they're going to ask, were they Polish uniforms? These guys served in the reserves prior to the war taking place, do you know? Let me, I'll answer that, and let me just make a note to answer that, and we'll we'll get to that. Any other? Right. No, 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 it's great. No, no, Thank you. asking questions this time. I'm just going to put it to the side for a moment, because we're actually going to gonna get to that. Um, anybody else uh, think what, how your students might react to, to watching that? Do they might have questions? I think they would positively engage with the sort of singing piece. Although they would want to know what the lyrics to that song were, right? Um, translated into English. Yes, we um, we have a, a wonderful blog article on our um, that I can go ahead and send you that has the uh, the lyrics uh, of of that there. So I'll I'll go ahead and uh, and send that to you. Thank you. Um, it might also give them a feeling of of support, you know, where they they see some people who obviously had all the odds against them and decided to fight anyway and to pick themselves up anyway and it might show them a way that that even though you might not have the numbers or the ideas behind you you can still do something you could still stand up and you can still fight for something that you believe in i think uh, my students and uh, for jerry Braden too we both teach at the same high school and we have it's all girls so I think the girls would be very impressed with the fact that they were women who were fighting back and they would really relate to that. And I think they would get, you know, very inspired by that. Great. We have a, a film on women in the partisan specifically and a study guide to go with the film. So my, um, and uh, other resources as well, e-learning course, et cetera. Um, great. So I'm going to, um, this next part, I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if I can present can share it because there's some images, but not a lot. So I, um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen, see if this works. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, really, thank you, everybody, for being uh, active participants in this. Um, it's really great. So um, just to go over, approximately 30,000 Jews fought back as partisans. Women made up about 10% of all Jewish, of actually this statistic I'm finding is is actually, um, they made up 10% of all partisans in general. In some um, units, they were as high as 25%. And this uh, woman right here, Sarah Fortas, she actually organized an all women battalion of partisans. So um, there were other units. A large number of them were Jewish partisans were teens. Many of them were the sole survivors from their families. So why was armed resistance rare? Number one, who would have thought it could have happened, you know? And even if it was, you know, the Nazis had this integrated campaign of lies and secrecy, as you can see below. So it was hidden, but also like this, it just was unthinkable that um, genocide and this integrated societal form of oppression could happen on this, on this level. And how do you fight the world's strongest army? How do you let people know what's happening there was no internet there were not phones in a lot of places you know my grandfather grew up in a village where they didn't even have a telegraph so how are they gonna how are they gonna share that the nazis had this um this policy of collective punishment so that if you didn't show up to if someone didn't show up for the daily count head count their whole family might be killed killed for it. There are instances where in reprisal for killing of a few uh, German soldiers, hundreds of Jews were murdered. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think your screen is shared. Did you mean to share it? Oh, it's not being scared? No, it's, I, I don't think anyone sees it. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, why don't we go back? Why don't you go back a ahead and, and uh, share again? I guess the, the sharing is still a bit, sure. a little bit touchy. Um, we're just going to um uh what yeah great so which uh i'm sorry back to the powerpoint okay and you can just yeah. forward and we'll make this powerpoint accessible to you so next so kind of some eight main reasons here you can kind of see it on screen next 
right? Where's a, where is a Jew going to get a gun unless they were already conscripted into the military before beforehand? Very few Jews had training. It was very difficult to get into the partisans because to get into the partisan troop, basically you had to have a gun to get in. That was the, that was the ticket in. Um, next slide. So um, basic history of the partisans. There were, um, you know, we had the breaking of the Soviet German non-aggression pact. And from at that time, um, then during the Blitzkrieg, um, you know, all the all of occup all of Soviet occupied Poland and was taken over, and then many other Eastern European countries, and then other eventually Western European countries, leaving a bunch of Soviet soldiers behind enemy lines. What they did is they ditched their uniforms, they buried their weapons, and they blended into the population. Once the German army had passed on through, then they regrouped, got their weapons and their uniforms, and started back up um, and, and started the first partisan units. There were hundreds of thousands of guerrilla fighters throughout um, Europe, most of them in Eastern Europe because the Soviet army had the best organization, but in, you know, there were a lot of homegrown, homegrown units as well, some of them uh, with the government and some of them just uh, citizens or parts of other political factions who were ultimately going to vie for control of the country at the at the end of the war. I'm not going to go into that more, but it's very interesting if you kind of think about our situation right now with um, with uh, militia groups, um, because there, you know, there there was a there was a lot of militias going on that were joining in the in the efforts and sometimes they would even fight each other. Uh, next slide. Uh, next, oh, okay, so um, yeah, next slide. So um, partisans um, were highly motivated because most of them had lost just about everything. Um, so often Jewish partisans were more effective than non-Jewish partisans. You had Jewish partisans in what we call mixed units. Um, and then you, we had also all Jewish units. So 10% of the partisans in Lithuania were Jewish, but they were responsible for the majority of, um, of train uh, derailments, um, far out of proportion for of injured soldiers as well. Uh, next slide. So three factors to partisan success and we really want to emphasize when you're teaching about the partisans that Jewish partisans weren't faster, they weren't stronger, they weren't smarter, they weren't braver than any other person during the Holocaust. What they were mainly was they were luckier. So, you know, there are tons of stories if you go through profiles on our website about how people just happen to have, you know, knew someone who knew someone who could get them into the partisans or were rescued by partisans. Um, what some of the others had next was the opportunity to join and the recognition that it was important because a lot of the time people didn't realize what was going on. So why would you, why would you join? And then some people also, next slide, had specialized knowledge. So for example, you would have people who were veterans or had been conscripted into the, um, into the various armies. So Jews who already knew how to use a gun, who took out their old uniforms, right? Um, or who um, or, or who were in action at the time and um, became partisans. Um, a lot of, but most, or they had some other specialized knowledge. They knew the local terrain. And so they were able to, um, to be able to show people around that house uh, Sonia Orba got into a partisan troop as her uncle Tzvi was a scout. And so it was important to the Soviets um, to have some, some local knowledge. So some Jews already had guns from previous military experience, 
the vast majority did not. Where did they get their uniforms? Well, sometimes they were issued them if they made it in, into the Soviets, but generally they stole them. Often they would loot German corpses um, if they had to, because the quality of the materials was much better. Often they had escaped from the ghettos or camps in rags. And so you'll um, actually find that they had um, you know, German uniforms or whatever uniform they might get be able to get off the battlefield. Some of them use those as disguises in order to infiltrate, um, in, infiltrate uh, German units uh, to get information. There were partisan spies um, or just to be able to pass uh, so people wouldn't suspect them. Next slide. So three main lessons that we compiled from talking about the partisans when they wanted to, when we asked them, what do you want future generations to know. And they, these are the three lessons that they really wanted us to be able to get across. And we hope that you can use these materials to help get across some of these life lessons. Speak out early and stand up against anti-Semitism and oppression in all its forms. Young people can make a difference. Partisans were sometimes as young as 12 years old and never give up. So, um, can you back up? So. Any, uh, yeah, the, the next slide, that's great. Um, any questions before we go on? And if you can stop sharing screen, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Spencer. Um, any questions before we go on? What was the second life lesson? I didn't get that. Uh, second life lessons uh, was, let's see. Um, young people can make a difference. And I'll go ahead and um, put the link to the presentation in the chat um, so that you can look at this later. Use the images. Great. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I'm just going to give you a, um, actually it's 152, yeah. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you a very short overview of the tactics lesson. Folks can take a break and we'll get, uh, we'll reconvene. Sound good? Great. Um, actually, just because of the way the PowerPoint is working, I think it'll be easier if we take a break now. So why don't we take five minutes, folks get water, do a bio break, and um, we'll come back. Let's just, uh, we'll give you seven minutes. We'll restart at two o'clock. If anybody has any questions or comments that you'd like us, like me to, uh, to get to, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat and uh, I'll be back as well. All right, see you in a few minutes. Resistance. Um, Welcome back, everybody. We're back to Tactics of Resistance. If people are willing to put yourself on camera, it's wonderful to be able to get your get your feedback. Oh, thanks so much, folks. That's great. Um, I hope you're able to get as good a response in your own classrooms uh, when you've been doing it online. Um, so this is the Tactics of Resistance uh, email. We're going to send you a uh, lesson. We're going to send you a link to this at the end, we're going to also ask you to fill out a uh, a brief survey. We'll send it um, with that with that survey link. And I uh, just want to show you what's in the Tactics of Resistance lesson. This is the same format as all of our um, larger lessons. We have lessons and then shorter study guides. We start off with uh, one pager of who are the Jewish partisans in case you can't show that film in your class, which is pretty much integrated into all our lessons. A little bit about how to use the lesson, then an overview about um, what happens in the lesson, what it's about, a guide where we talk about some of the terms and some of the reasoning about what's going on, how to set up your classroom. This one is a fairly involved setup. Um, this is probably our most sophisticated lesson that we have. Um, so, you know, if it's, uh, you know, I, I hope you'll find it really, really useful, but we have a lot more if you don't have time to uh, 
to do two classroom classes. Most of our lessons, you can just kind of get up, roll out of bed once you've once you've read it, and they're ready. They're ready to go. Um, so we have the, so, and then we'll we go ahead and we um, have the um, the procedure of of what happens. Um, so just because of of the um, let's see. Um, yeah, just because of the of the tech, I think I'm just gonna kind of skip ahead a little bit. We're gonna run through this lesson pretty quickly, uh, but you then you can always go back to the e-learning course to get more details on it if you want kind of more of a step by step uh, running running you through it. So um, we go ahead into this piece, Tales of Resistance. Um, and actually, Spencer, if you can go ahead and show this one piece from the e-learning, that would be great. And this kind of talks gets into how we how we use um, the the concept of what we call the resistance matrix, which we'll get to. But this is kind of the heart of the. Ooh, there we go. That this is the heart of the lesson um, for for doing this. And then we have this like little piece that'll show you how to use it beforehand. So, Spencer, are you able to show to share that? Yeah, it's just, I'm sorry, just one second. No problem. Okay. Can you all see it or? Uh, it's the e-learning, yeah, it's the e-learning video. Oh, the video, I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. And you may recognize one of the uh, participants, one of the people in this video. Part one of the e-learning oh, course tactics. All right, um, this is going to be chapter four, I think. Um, I'm sorry if that that link didn't get it to you. It's um, Tales of Resistance. Let's see, no, the next. The A next Resistance one. and. There's the one that says Tales of Resistance. Oh, oh. great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Activity, Tales of Resistance, which introduces the, the resistance make right here. Yeah, uh, yeah, this should be it. Okay, good. Tricks. Students apply critical and creative thinking to the core concepts through a brief, oh, brief engaging scenario. In this activity, we introduce the matrix, but it's a bit simpler than the one you'll use in lesson two. Though it uses the same four columns, aggression, resistance, short and long-term outcomes, we leave the various categories of aggression and resistance, discrimination, violence, and so on, out for this lesson. Start by drawing and labeling the four columns on the board. Then introduce the conflict the students will analyze. This is detailed in the procedure section. We use a scenario that your students can relate to. Here's the scenario. I saved up for months to buy myself a car, but before I could even take it out, my sister snatched my keys and went out for a ride with her friends. So here's what I did. I put a padlock on her door and wouldn't give her the combination until she gave me the keys back. Got my keys, but I also got in trouble with my parents. Students analyze the aggression, the resistance as a response, and outcomes that resulted. Imagining a plausible conflict with obviously ridiculous tactics draws the students in, encouraging their participation. This teaches the techniques to apply in more high-stakes conflicts later in this lesson. Show students how to fill in the matrix. Ask them to identify the aggression, resistance, and outcomes from the story. Summarize their answers and place the answers in the appropriate columns. So what was the aggression? Your sister stole your keys. Stole my keys. So how did I resist? You locked the door. Padlock. Then what happened? You got your keys back. But you got in trouble. Got my keys back, but in trouble. Evaluate the outcomes with your students, marking them as positive, negative, mixed, or unknown using symbols such as plus, minus, or a question mark. Ask your class to evaluate the tactic's effectiveness based on the outcomes and the act's possible objectives. So what do you think? Was it worth it? I don't know. No. 
Well, it all depends on my objectives, right? If I want to win at all costs, sure, I got my keys back, total success. But if my goal is to get my keys back with the least fuss, not so good. Next, brainstorm and evaluate possible alternatives. What else could I have done? Snatch your keys back. Mm, not gonna work. My sister's way bigger than me. Use your words. Use your words. Okay? What's another thing? Tell on her. Go to your parents. Tell on her. Put snakes in her room. Students will come up with off-the-wall answers like that, which is exactly what we want. Encouraging practical and outrageous answers to foster creative thinking and to get your students to relate in a real way to the lesson. The matrix naturally exposes flaws in more inappropriate answers, particularly when you explore unintended consequences of impulsive actions. For example, someone will inevitably suggest hitting the sister. That act might provide the protagonist with a short-term sense of satisfaction, which, compared to the longer-term consequence of getting grounded, may not be worth it. When evaluating inappropriate answers, it's important to elicit positive and negative possible outcomes. After all, there must be some real or perceived benefits, or people wouldn't choose such tactics. If students persist in defending outrageous responses, the key question to ask is, does this actually resolve the situation? Now that your students understand the basic concepts, introduce the subcategories of non-confrontational, confrontational nonviolence, confrontational non and resistance by force. Place the definition list you prepared before class on the whiteboard, then use it to classify a few tactics that the students just generated with the sister scenario. So let's get some examples. Non-confrontational resistance, going to your parents, right? Because you're not dealing with your sister. But putting snakes in her room? Definitely confrontational. Unless they were venomous, in which case, that would be violent. The next act... Uh, I think you're muted. You're on mute. Jonathan, Jonathan, Jonathan we can't hear muted. you. Thank you. You might have seen just real briefly, thank you, Spencer, for showing that. Real briefly before um, stop sharing screen, there was a little pop-up there. At the end of most chapters in our e-learning system, that pop-up will have a quiz. And then if you get um, eighty percent or more on all the quizzes, then you pass. Then you pass this, and it goes into. Um, you can go ahead and do, do a printable certificate to go ahead and uh, submit to our friends at the Holocaust Commission here. You can send it over to Doug um, for credit, uh, or to your to your supervisor as well. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no problem. I'll grade easy on that then. <laughs> 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 um, so yeah, I wanted to show that to you so you can kind of see a little bit about how this goes in the classroom and it's uh, more efficient than I can get it across uh, right away. Any thoughts or questions on that so far? Okay. So um, yeah, so once again, you know, we don't want to spoon feed answers, but we want, you know, students to be able to kind of find it. Obviously, you know, you may have students who like just hold their position on an inappropriate answer. Or I've been in schools where, you know, the student said, you know, what's talking about a bullying situation. And they're like, I punched them back. And I was, we talked about the positive and negative consequences. And they were like, look, if, if that's the only language that they understand. And I can't sit in that student's shoes. Um, and, um, you know, and just use this lesson to manipulate her into changing her whole life view. But um, our hope is that it can start getting students to start thinking about um, how they respond and um, impulsive violence in particular, right? Which is kind of the key to impulsive is like, can you just take a moment and pause? So I'm gonna go ahead and share screen again. Um, let's see. Oh, wait, not that one, sorry. Go 
back to this one. Oh, hmm. Hold on one second. Sorry about this. Stop sharing. Get our PowerPoint. Now what happens? Ah, there we go. Okay. So, um, so in addition to the resistance categories, we also have um, categories of, uh, of aggression. And we have these broad categories, discrimination, deprivation of the and theft, violence, and mass violence. And we have some examples of how we've classified these in. So um, for example, someone was talking earlier uh, about kind of more psychological violence, right? So um, we've, you know, categorize that under um, discrimination, but you could easily say that some, that forms of psychological torture, right, or, or forms of racism that are like so pervasive um, that the messaging itself is a form of violence because of the physiological effects that it, that it has, for example. Um, so these are tactics that um, Jews used in the Holocaust specifically. Um, but you can apply this to most situations. So then you're going to go ahead and, you know, put it into this resistance ma matrix. And, but, um, but in the next scenarios, you're going to classify them as well. So the next step is that you, the students will read a biography of Frank Bleichmann and we have the teacher's version, which kind of shows you pieces of resistance and aggression in there. You're gonna identify those with the students and then fill out a matrix. And what we try to do here is in this matrix, you can see that there's this aggression. There were armbands. Frank took off his armbands and bicycled from town to town uh, in order to, to be able to buy and sell goods illegally um, without them them knowing what happened. Um, and what we also want to kind of bring out in this is that in a lot of these categories, you have this what we call symmetric resistance, right? So for example, in um, discrimination, they were told that, you know, they couldn't practice religion, but they went ahead and celebrated Shabbat in secret. So we had non-confrontational, we had non-violence meeting discrimination. Whereas when it got to genocide, that's when we got to the partisan warfare. Um, however, you can have asymmetric resistance. And we have this, you know, for example, in the roundups, right? Some, you know, escaping was a nonviolent, non-confrontational response to mass violence. Does that, uh, people following along? Okay, great. Um, so you can go ahead and apply this to other things. We have some sample matrices uh, in the lesson, uh, including um, the Boston Tea Party, for example, that we don't do all the lines, um, the genocide in Rwanda, um, and, um, and if you're a religious school teacher, I think we have one on, this, on the story, the, the Passover story of the Exodus. Um, and if you come up with one, please send it, send it to us. The idea being, that you can go ahead and look at conflicts using this tool throughout the year. So we want to give you a tool that if you chose, you could start, you could use this now. And then um, if you're teaching a history class, you could take other uh, conflicts and run it through the, the matrix. Or you can, if you're doing a theater class, you can go ahead and take, you know, what is the, uh, what is the conflict here? Um, and like I said, you can use examples like you saw in the video of how to actually deal with actual situations. And I've done this with people, with classes talking about bullying. Uh, a friend of mine, when I, was, when I was developing this lesson, who is trans and trying to figure out like how they want to deal with the fact that the bathrooms were only male and female. And they were very frustrated. And so we worked out, you know, we went through the matrix and like ran some scenarios and then they went ahead and tried it and had came up with like some creative solutions. I think what they decided to do was to put their own signs on the bathroom. Um, 
So just an example. Um, so uh, we're going to go ahead and use the matrix right now to analyze the events of January 6th of the insurrection. And I have a short video I could show, but I'm guessing even though this was six months ago, it's still in the minds. Are, is this something that's kind of in the air at your schools, by the way? Or do students talk about this still? Uh, yes, and I have a mixed class politically. Uh, a lot of them are pro-Trump, so there would be uh, a, a thing wherein complicating who the good guys and the bad guys are would be in, in the best interest of these kids. Great, great. So, um, yeah, so I want to show you this scenario. We can run it and you can see if this is something that would, um, that, that would help um, bring some nuance to what's to what's going on. So I'm gonna go ahead and share, I believe it's on this one and um, great. So we're gonna go ahead and do a matrix and we're gonna do it from the point of view of the insurrectionists. So um, the important thing about, you know, so we're talking about um, can talk a little bit about the events leading up to it, as well as the actual takeover of the Capitol. But before we go ahead and look at what actually was happening, um, what were their possible objectives? What were they trying to achieve in taking over the Capitol building? So that Trump would be, get his job back again. Okay. To put it in a very short context. Okay, so that's great. Trump get job back, right? Um, so we'll just call it, you know, um, Trump back in White House, right? Um, what else? Any other objectives? What were they trying to achieve? I mean, I guess it's uh, to, to retain Trump in the White House, right? Because they viewed the election as Ill illegitimate. So right. therefore, to, to say... Uh, to, to have back would mean that they had lost in the first place, which they were not sort of psychologically in a position to be able to. Right. So great. So beyond the election result, what else might they have been trying to achieve? Uh, taking real America back for real Americans. Okay. And uh, real can be put in whatever quotes you want to do. Right. So what's, what's, a, what's a term one of your students might use to describe that? Is, is that something that they, they would say? I would say they would refer to it. I mean, like it's it, it's a Catholic school in Vermont, and some of my kids would say they're 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 trying to stop socialists. They're trying to trying to stop socialist Joe Biden from making America a communist country. Right. So they might even say where they're trying to stop a takeover. Right. Yeah. Sure. They might even say that. Okay. So, um, from their point of view, what? is some of the aggression that they're responding to. What are they perpetrating, right? I just wanna go back. This, is, this objective thing is like really, to me, I think one of the most important parts is to try to think about why, why are they doing what, they do, what they're doing? And you may not get their motivations. Like you can't say like, I, they're, they were traumatized as a youth or, or whatever, but what are they actually trying to achieve and then you can evaluate, did they achieve it or did they not, right? So, um, you know, for example, it's very different if the resistance objective is to retain the office, if then the objective of they want to send a message, right? So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, so what were they responding to? What is some of the aggression they were responding to? They felt like a lot of their rights were taken away Okay, so rights taken away. Would you call that discrimination or deprivation? Theft. I would think they would see it as discrimination because they want to keep America white again. Okay, so, um, so um, maybe maybe they would say something like this: reverse racism, right? They might say yeah, that. that works. Um, I'm definitely putting that in quotes, but. I would also um, say of a deprivation, right? 
Like mm -hmm. they viewed both Georgia and Arizona as states that were rightfully theirs. So they were deprived of the electoral votes of Georgia and Arizona, which right. they saw as their territory. Right, right. Now I just want to I just want to back up because I put in the terms reverse racism, and I'm just wondering from the teachers, like, okay, you have a student who says this. Is this something that you would want to write on the board, or would you want to restate this because it's kind of this a hot term? Depends on what state you live in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'll be I see, I see you saying school. something, but you were you were muted. Whether it's a public school or a private school, also, yeah. And uh, how secure you felt in your own job, whether or not you'd lose your job over this uh, lesson plan. <laughs> um, so um, you know, um, what's another term we might use? discrimination against white people or that they're, I mean, I'm just trying to, to say what, what's a, what's kind of a more neutral term that, that you might be able to use to describe what their, their position. How about nativist? nativist. The no nothing party. Okay. Um, all right. So um, what else are they responding to? What are other forms of aggression that they're responding to? Aggressive speech by several of the speakers. Um, from the part of they, they think that the election was stolen. Yes. So um, aggressive. Um, so like um, aggressive speech from from pro from pro Biden supporters. Hey, come on, come to eat. For example. OK. Um, anything else? So, yeah. Um, now, some people, right, we're going to come back to this. Some people will say, right, hey, these are, these are child molesters, right? There's this whole conspiracy theory about, you know, Pizzagate and all that. And you may, you may get that, right? Um, and so that, that, that may come, come in. What is some of the resistance that they, that, that they, um, that the insurrectionists used. What did they do? Well, they wanted to be seen and heard and recognized and valued. And the way they did this was by, I guess, you know, making this grand gesture to get into the Capitol building. Okay, so they were, let's see. So they had, they, th there was the, the takeover. Right, so that was one. But they also had demonstrations. They created websites. Okay, carrying their signs and flags. Right, flags and the flags. You could say they were confrontational. You could say they were non-confrontational. Right, um, especially you know they might think that it was non-confrontational, and definitely you know other people might say, oh, that's really confrontational. Um, can we have one or two other examples? I was going to say they showed up, like the sheer number of them. There was just a ton mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mass gathering. Right. And even the gesture of sitting at a representative's, like sitting behind a representative's desk, it was a uh, symbolic gesture that, you know, this is our house. Hmm. I mean, not to get into the, the gross details, but I guess uh, defecating in the Capitol, that's that's a symbolic act for sure. Right, right. Um, property damage, right? Damage slash defecation. Um, okay, so then um, let's look at some of the outcomes. What are some of the short... Let's look at... Um, let's say, let me see, where's the lines? Here we go. Um, so let's, can I, is this going to let me do this? Um, here, hold on a second. Let me just go over here and grab a line. 
much easier to do this in person. Okay, so let's say they're responding to what they perceive to be aggressive speech, right? So then they went ahead and created websites, right? What is the a short term and a long term effect of their creating the websites? Well, I mean, they they distributed information to people who may not necessarily be on either side, could be influenced. Mm -hmm. um, so their opinions and views were spread to to other people. Okay, great. And then I, I put a, I put a, a plus sign of it. You'd actually go ahead and and evaluate it later. But let's say that's a that for them is a win. Um, can you think of a negative consequence, either short or long term, to their websites? In their opinion? Yeah. So. Well, not not necessarily. It doesn't have to be in their opinion. So maybe it's it was proof. I mean, when they, it was false information, mm -hmm. it was proof that their ideas, you know, were not valid. Some of their ideas were not valid, so it wasn't as strong as they thought it would be. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. That makes um, sense. Yeah. Uh, uh, lots of spurious information, right? Um, Delegitimized. Right, I think a, I think a lot of people on the right. Let's not say necessarily insurrectionists, but a lot of people on the right would would agree with that. Um, um, okay, so let's go ahead and look at um, demonstrations, short and long term effects. What are what just where are some outcomes? Well, short term, they were absolutely heard and seen on that day, not just in this country, but around the world. So mm -hmm. they made a, a very flashy statement, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, then again, on The Daily Show, right, they were made to look like fools. You know different opinions on, on how that happened. All right, let's go, let's go over to the, the takeover, right? Let's say um, attacking guards, right? What are, some, what are some outcomes of that, long and short term? 500 of them are got arrested and have been okay. charged. 500 arrested, what else happened? Destruction of the loss of life. Building. What's that, Rebecca? I'm sorry, I said loss of life. Okay, so. Loss of life. Nope, oh, that's small. Did that. Um, anything else? Uh, they'll have to well, overturn the vote. Right. Sort of a positive long-term effect is their sort of hagiography that's being made about them by Trump and news aspects. You know, a, a mythology is created long term. Okay, so the the movement um, is uh, historic, gaining so traction. They, they create his, history. Yeah. The same. Okay, so then you can go ahead and look at it. You know, often you do these arrows later, right? So, but you you look at this and you say, okay, stolen votes, right? And let's go ahead and attacking guards, right? Right, and then you can go ahead and look at this, right? And you can see the positive and negative consequences. You can kind of evaluate them. And you can also ask, um, uh, let's see, just, you know, for comparison, well, one, one of the things I'm, I'm going to say is, well, let's, let's go ahead and look at our their objectives, right? If their objective was to stop a takeover, right, did they achieve their objective? No. 
But what objectives did they achieve? They created doubt. They muddied the waters. Right. Right. So, you know, we can add that, right? You can go ahead and add that. Um, right. And, you know, I, per, you know, um, perhaps in a, you know, I mean, for some people it was an intentional consequence, but I don't think anybody, uh, or, you know, in some cases it was a, you know, there, there was a lot of hate speech going on. So maybe they were, they did intend for people to, to die, but I think a lot of people showed up who weren't on the bandwagon of violence, who got kind of swept up in it. Um, so you can go ahead and run the scenario, right? You kind of look at it, talk about some of these nuances, and you can talk about it like right or wrong is one question. What, um, you know, that, that's, that, that can get really, really complicated. But you can also look at it in terms of comparing, was the resistance, we'll call it quote unquote resistance here, right? But one person's aggression is another person's resistance. Um, was the resistance symmetric? If you compare it, let's say, to this one that did in a in another workshop of how the re, um, let's see which one was it um, situation uh, right um, of if the um, if things were symmetrical or not right. Um, then you can kind of see like, oh, okay, the, the different forms of, dis of aggression and resistance, right, at least as it's defined here, were fairly much in parallel, right? Violence was used when there was violence, right? In, um, in terms of rhetoric, rhetoric was matched by rhetoric um, on that side. But, you know, on this side, um, you know, you had an asymmetric, you had a, a very outsized response. Um, and then that can lead to some very interesting conversations. So any thoughts, questions about that? How do you think something like that might go? Now, but obviously I'm using a very um, hot button issue, right? So you may or may not want to go with this in your classroom. Um, so I'd be interested in your opinions of A, you know, what do you think might happen if you use this scenario? But what do you think might happen if you use a scenario like the Revolutionary War? Revolutionary War, you'd probably be okay. If you do this, you better have tenure. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. Yeah, no, Doug and, and I- it's, 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 on You're gonna have to really plan this out to a lead up. Say you were gonna do this on Wednesday, Right. You need to do a lot of stuff Monday and Tuesday. And then Thursday, you're going to have to answer it to the principal and the parents that have called the building. All right. And then Friday, you may be unemployed. Right. You know, at this point. I mean, all of us, I mean, especially with the states that are passing, legis passing legislation, they don't want you to do anything controversial. Yeah. I mean, this is like over the top. This is what you want students to argue about and have discussions in class so that they can see what happens all right, from different points of view. Um, but I'm retired now, so I don't have to worry about this. <laughs> <laughs> right, so this this was for um, more of a dramatic rhetorical <laughs> demonstration of what, what might be, what you what might happen. But uh, part of what this also kind of touches into is, you know, something that you may think may not elicit a very strong reaction someone may have a much larger reaction reaction to. I know, I'm sure you've found this in your in your classroom as well. And so it's good to kind of think a little bit um, about how you might want to might want to handle some of those. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, we're wanting to be able to engage um, students um, in when I say we, JPEF, uh, we're really wanting to have students engage critically in what's in what's happening. Um, so part of the thing that we also kind of put in here is it's not about who's right or wrong. This is really about exploring different viewpoints and how can we evaluate them. Yeah, which would be great if our kids and their parents 
weren't so right and wrong focused. Because I'm 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 seeing this because I'm also, you know, as a literature teacher, I'm teaching night. And as a social studies teacher, I'm teaching American Revolution, which could very much do a little Boston Tea Party thing. And I can tell that the way that would go is Jews good, Nazis bad, Americans good, British bad. And therefore they, they can use this, which is meant to complicate an issue and turn it to reinforce a black and white us versus them understanding that they're getting from national news media, that they're getting from their parents because their parents really want to live in a world where Fox News is right and everything is wrong. Uh, so I, I, I very much take Doug's thoughts in hand, you know, teaching at a private school, being somebody who knows that their job is very much on the line. If 51% if of parents don't like what I'm doing, that's, that's, that's that. Um, so within, within the context of Jewish resistance, I can see this being usable. And, and I appreciate you you getting us to think more deeply about uh, the January 6th uh, insurrections, but that's definitely not something that right. teachers who want to keep their jobs are going to be doing in the classroom. Right, right. So thank, thank you. <laughs> Talking thank you. about the tool that you've used and not the subject that you've got us thinking about, but that tool in itself, I mean, I think it's a super beneficial tool on any with any age, depending on the topic. Because I'm in an elementary school and with our students, we talk a lot about what it means to disagree with an idea and not the person, um, how they need to have a voice in something that they believe. Um, and it could be something simple like uh, some kind of a behavior that somebody has where you spark a discussion where not as everybody agrees, but they can see things from different points of view. So. The tool itself, I, I could see using in my classroom for a ton of different ways. Great, great. Um, any other, any other thoughts or questions? Jonathan, I may, I may try to actually, you know, use this with my college students this semester. Um, it's a little bit safer there. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to be obviously. I'm not going to be on Zoom, which is driving me freaking nuts. Um, and I'll be back in the classroom and they always bring up resistance, but it's, it's I know that the January 6th thing was brought up even in my Zoom class that I had, that some kids even made the statement, I think we're in 1930s Germany, you know, with the brown shirts and the insurrection and that type of stuff. So it was interesting how they were viewing this. Out of the 20 kids that I had, there wasn't one of them. Um, and they were relatively verbal because they, they're into the technology and Zoom things more than I am. Um, that they thought that was totally wrong. I mean, out of line, like over the top. Yeah. Which was rather interesting. And I try to, you know, be non-biased in my view because my job is to get them to critically think about different issues and think on both sides. But it was interesting to see what their responses are. But I would like to use this. And I'll let you know how you make out. Great. If I still have a job at Stockton. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, uh, have people go into breakout rooms and we'll give you just five or six minutes and talk about um, just how you might use this in the classroom. So if we can go ahead and put in two groups of, um, let's say three or four, and if people wouldn't mind putting on their cameras, give you a chance to just share a couple of ideas how you might use um, any part of this lesson from the slideshow to the matrix to even just a sheet talking about here are some different resistance tactics. Um, so Spencer, are you able to set up a... Uh... Yes, I can set it up. Great. And then while you're in there, if, um, uh, if, if something strikes you that you want to share back with the group, please, please do. Great, so welcome back, folks. Um, I'm wondering if anybody had an idea or heard an idea that they'd like to like to share with the group. Chris had a really good thing that he mentioned at ours about conflict revolution. I really like that idea. Chris, you may want to tell everybody about that. Oh, thanks. Um, so uh, 
you know, in the group we were just talking, Doug and I were talking about um, you know, how we would use this. And I said, I would probably use, I teach fifth grade, so I'd probably use this more likely uh, to have a conversation about conflict, conflict resolution um, and long and short term consequences, you know, in terms of actions or reactions to challenges. Um, so. Great, great. And do you think you might use this with like something they've studied or a story or something that's actually like occurring or has occurred uh, in your class? Oh, um, I guess maybe um, just the sort of basic challenges that the kids of course sort of can, can kind of all um, understand you know, that they kind of, the typical things that they face at that, that age, um, you know, how they would respond to such a thing and uh, make sure that their responses are appropriate. And if they thought about what, what is a long-term consequence to my reaction. Great, great, thanks. Uh, Thank does you. anybody else want to share? Maybe we can hear one more, one more idea that people had. Or something that you heard, maybe a, a tip or um, maybe even some other piece of the, the curricula other than the resistance matrix. When I was talking with Michelle, um, and she teaches in high school, and she was saying um, how she had to, she teaches French, and they're going to be teaching about the resistance, the French resistance, and um, they're expecting her to teach all of her lessons in French, and coming into this experience, like, I, I honestly feel like people are expected to jump in with two feet, and we actually have to reteach them how to have a discussion effectively, how to um, create an argument without being confrontational. Uh, if you don't believe in a rule, how do you express it without all this negativity? Because we've been apart, you know, if you have a kid who's going into fifth grade like Chris, you're really getting maybe a third half year way through the school year, third grader, if you haven't been in school. So in order to get to those difficult topics or make them think in a broader scale, we have to start way back and make that you, like your matrix, make them think about all the steps to get to what they're talking about, to get to conflict resolution, you know, to, to bring in these SEL ideas you know, where, where we're thinking about what our reaction is. Is our reaction equal to, you know, our problem? And what happens when it's not? And how do we, you know, engage them in those ideas? So it was interesting that her school is expecting her to just jump in in another language and teach them from the get-go. And mm -hmm. I think that she has a challenge. Yeah, uh, because I was going to say, uh, Rebecca, that French one, for example, I mean, we're, French one, we teach them colors, numbers, what they want us to jump in with this. Although I must say, um, you know, um, the Holocaust was easy to come up with lessons and whatnot in French. Um, but, and especially La Résistance, which is really uh, very much part of the French history. I think they will find that interesting. I just have to make it relatable and, and I have to figure out how to do it for French one. I, I don't know how they would uh, understand what I was saying. You know, in Fr French three might get a little bit, you know, but French one and two, a little bit Ooh. difficult. I'm wishing you, wishing you lots of luck. I know. I, as you were talking, as you were talking, thank you. I was thinking, okay, now how am I, I going to do that in French? How are they going to understand that? <laughs> Um, someone did say, how would you suggest to introduce these ideas to some of our younger students? And I would go ahead and use that simplified matrix that you saw mm -hmm. earlier on and not necessarily get into any of the terminology. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show you a couple of resources and answer a few questions. And um, uh, and I, uh, Spencer, I put a question to you in the, in the chat. If you're able to um, answer that, that would be, that would be great. Thanks. So um, I'm just going to show you the, the J JPEF website real quick. Um, this is our homepage. If folks, your students can go to, can go to this thing, what is a partisan to learn more about the partisans? Um, we have this page, Partisans and Countries. So every day there's a featured partisan. They can go ahead and look up a partisan. Um, you can also do it by country. 
um, we have this map. You can just go ahead and click on Poland. It'll give you an overview of what happened in Poland. We have all these um, archival images. You click on them and you'll get larger pictures of them. Um, and then a whole list of partisans from that, from that country. Um, you can also find our films page. There's a whole lot more stuff in here um, as well. But, you know, women in the partisans, someone asked about anti-Semitism in the partisans. A lot of partisans had to hide their identity within partisan units because of anti-Semitism. Um, they, um, or they faced some, some very severe consequences. Um, so we have a film and we have curricula um, on that. But um, as Ed Asner, who's a narrated, um, I believe he narrated this one as well, said, you know, it's a war on three fronts that partisans were fighting against the Germans and their uh, collaborators, against, um, against uh, a populace that was often against them, and then often against even other partisan units. You actually had all Jewish units being ambushed by non-Jewish units, partisan units, who should be their allies, um, and they had to contend with, contend with that. Um, if you click the teach here or you go to, um, to curricula, then you can download all of our lessons. We ask you to uh, create a free account just so we can have some statistics to show our funders. Um, you'll also need that for the e-learning and that helps you start and stop the course um, whenever you want. You can go here, our blog I mentioned, there's all sorts of things, Jewish partisan community, and then also there's the films page where you can see all of our films. Um, so I think I addressed uh, the questions that people had. Um, if people have more questions, um, we have uh, people can stay on. If you want to stay on a little bit more, I'm happy to answer more questions. Does someone right now have a burning question? Like I need to need to ask this one before we end. All right. We're going to be sending you evaluations. We really appreciate um, if you can sign them um, in the evaluation. I think we asked for your address so we can send you some cool stickers uh, to share with your students. And um, I just want to, first of all, thank you for your time. I know there's so much going on and Zoom fatigue and all that. So really appreciate what you're doing and also, I mean, that you're here, but also what you're doing. I mean, gosh, in these times what you're teaching is so critically important. And if you only share one thing from this with your students, please share that seven minute video of the introduction to the partisans. It is transformative. I've seen the effects on other students. I've seen it on, on myself. And just to have this other narrative, I think you're doing your students a great favor. And I just wanna share a story, personal story about the effects that learning about resistance has had on me. So when I started this job, I had to watch, learn much more about the Holocaust than I knew and than I wanted to know. Really disturbing images. I started having um, these dreams where I was tied down on a table, being tortured, just horrible things happening for me. As I started to learn more about the partisans, the dreams started to shift and one night, I was rescued by partisans. And then that went on for a few nights. I mean, I was still having these nightmares. Then I had a dream where I became a partisan and I was able to rescue someone else. And then the dream stopped. So I hope that these materials, whatever materials you're using can be used not just to educate, but to really um, can have a healing quality. And I know that as educators, right, we're, we're looking out not just to get the information in, but that's really what's behind the information that's so much. And I really salute everybody who's been doing classroom work at this time. It's so challenging. So thank you so much for coming. Feel free to stay on, ask questions. If you have comments, happy to talk. And thank you so much to Keen for have, hosting this and having us on. And thank you so much for Spencer for doing all that technical support <laughs> and um, wishing you well. Yes.